And uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Why in the World Do We Work? Okay, can I have my slides? Why in the world do we work? All right. So, why in the world do we work? Okay. So, why do you work? Okay. So, if, if uh, how, how, how about like that? Those who are uh, the older generation, okay, whoever, yeah. Maybe answer first. Why do you work? You have an answer in your, in your mind already. Why do you work? Older generation. Maybe you're in between, huh? but you have to decide. Are you the older generation or the younger generation? Okay. So if you feel young at heart, you can answer later. Okay, then the younger generation, maybe you can ask, why do you work? For money? Is that older generation speaking or younger generation speaking? Okay, my guess, my guess is, if you belong to the older generation, your answer is likely to be to put food on the table. Lah. Why so complicated? Work is work. Whether you like it or not, just put food on the table, provide for the family. That's why older generation, uh, some of them, they can work for decades. Uh. I was talking to somebody here who has worked for 40 decades in the same company. Uh. Wow. Oh, not 40 decades, 4 decades, 4 decades. 40 decades, 400. 4 decades in the same company, first and last job. Wow. Praise God. And then many of us here have worked many years in the same company. Why? Because work has nothing to do with what? Gratification, la, self-actualization, la, meaning, la, purpose. No, 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 no. Food. Work is just put food on the table. But if you ask today's generation, it's unlikely to say, oh, I, I work just to put food on the table. Very unlikely. Most of the time, it, oh, I want to find meaning. Is this food meaningful? Is it work-life balance? Am I growing? Am I learning? Is there self-actualization? Correct or not? That's most likely the answer. Uh, so so we, we find that people work for a very, very different reason. And because of the pandemic, uh, actually, people are job hopping more lah, huh? because they want you mean you cannot let me work from home ah? sorry I cannot sign with you okay so now it's standard if you don't allow them to work from home uh, they will, uh, better not so a lot of people are job hopping in fact it's common the trend is growing so it's no longer uh, such a big taboo uh, in the HR so people are still employing you and uh, you give very good reasons uh, why you job hop so why people work has uh, kind of evolved with uh, the COVID as well people are now more aware of uh, what they want, work-life balance becomes something very important and work from home is almost a given uh, nowadays. So you cannot work for Elon Musk. Huh? Elon Musk will make you work, come in every day. All right? So today, uh, we want to talk about what is the purpose of work, uh, what is the biblical purpose of work. You know, and uh, in my first sermon, I talk about is work a necessary evil? Is work just a paycheck? So I talk about work being more than a paycheck. It is a gift from God. Then in my second sermon, I talk about his work curse. So I talk about why his work so challenging. Because after the fall, our spiritual relationship was affected. Our, our personal relationship is affected. And then our work environment is affected. Even though work is not cursed. Okay? But it's challenging. That's why work is so challenging. So today, I'm going to explore the biblical purpose of why we work. Why did God give us this gift of work? And you realize it's actually very different from popular culture. What does popular culture tell us? Work is for, for yourself. Okay? To put food on the table, for meaning, for purpose, for self-actualization, for self-gratification. Work is about profit maximization. It's transactional. So basically, work is all about you. If you're not happy, you can fire your boss. Okay? So in order to find out what is the biblical purpose of work, we have to go back to the very beginning. Okay, in the Garden of Eden, when God instituted work, what was His plan? What is His idea? You know, same with marriage. You want to know why marriage? Go back to the Garden of Eden. So why did God give Adam and Eve work? We have to go back there. Uh, and, and today, work is not just, uh, like I mentioned, not just paid work. If you are a student, what is your work? Studying. So you better study hard. Okay, because you've got the next 40 years to work if you don't study well. Wow, they're all scared already. Okay? If you are a, a retiree, what's your work? Your work is to take care of your grandchildren if you have. If you don't have, it's to take care of the house or, or do something meaningful. If you are a homemaker, what's your work? Your work is very important. Your husband should pay you. And all the homemakers say amen. Okay? Very important. They should pay you because your work is nurturing the next generation. Clean the house. Okay? So get a salary for your husband after this sermon. 
All right, so, so what is work? Work is, is very different from the Bible uh, and what popular culture tells us. So essentially, work is founded on, is on this verse in Genesis, okay, in the Garden of Eden, where God said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. So I mentioned uh, before in Sermon 1 that we are royal co-creators. You know, royal co-creators with God. And what, what does it mean? You see, here in this passage, you see God made male and female in His image to represent Him to govern all creation. Okay, so that was the work assigned to Adam and Eve. Why do I talk about royal co-creator in my sermon one? Because I mentioned in ancient time, only kings are said to be bearing God's image. So when, when, uh, when, when Genesis say you're made in God's image, it's a royal term. You are like a king. You're made in God's image. And what else? This word called subdue and dominion is very powerful words because it is talking about master subject relationship okay so god is the master we are the subject so but when god gave us the authority and the power to represent him to subdue and to have dominion he's saying you are kings to represent god the king you have the power to subdue creation you have the power to dominate creation okay so that was the job title of god and he has given it to us to govern the earth and what are we supposed to do we are supposed to govern it well, bring the full potential, make sure the, the whole creation is taken care of. And this, these two verses, in theological terms, is called cultural mandate. Okay, have you heard of cultural mandate? You have heard of the Great Commission mandate. Okay, but seldom is it talk that this is a cultural mandate. What's a cultural mandate? The word cultural comes from the word culture. You're supposed to create culture, kingdom culture. Where does the word culture come from? Cultivate. You need to cultivate the ground to produce crops. You need to cultivate civilization to produce cities. Okay, so the word cultivate produce culture, and that's where we get cultural mandate. So Adam and Eve, they are supposed to manage the whole earth and do it so well that the whole earth becomes like Eden. That was their job. Okay, so that is the cultural mandate. They are supposed to be masters over creation and they are supposed to bring God's kingdom to every part of the world, not just Eden. Uh, and, and, and that's why God is so upset about Tower of Babel. What happened in the Tower of Babel? The people at the Tower of Babel were trying to stick to themselves. They're trying to create a kingdom for themselves on their own and they refuse to multiply. They refuse to be spread out throughout the earth. They refuse to bring God's kingdom to every part of the world. And that's why God was so angry and He had to destroy the Tower of Babel. Okay, so our job, the foundation of work is actually we are supposed to be kingdom makers. We're supposed to make God's kingdom on earth and let it spread throughout the earth. So that is the foundation of work. That is the foundation, uh, uh, the narrative that is so different from popular culture. Uh, so this foundation of work means that every one of you is actually a royal co-creator. You're supposed to come up with solution. You're supposed to solve problems. You're supposed to take care of the environment, take care of creation, take care of cities, Make sure that we have a kingdom culture. So that was the foundation uh, of work uh, that was given. But did society actually abide by this foundation? No, right? Uh, we exploit the earth. Instead of taking care, we exploit earth. That's why in Singapore, we had the, one of the highest degrees uh, temperature right, recorded. What was that? 37 degrees. Wow. Very, very high. Okay, uh, Global warming because we are doing stuff to the environment that is killing the environment. In Vietnam, they also had a record, 44 degrees. Wow, 
How about Australia? Australia is worse. Uh. Record 50 degrees. Wow, who wants to stay in uh, Australia? Okay, wow. Joshua, yes. So, because we fail to be kingdom builders, because we fail to bring Eden throughout the whole earth, we, ha- we fail to build God's kingdom throughout the whole earth, uh, we, we fail to carry His image and reproduce and multiply and bring the kingdom culture to every place. That's why the earth is suffering. Uh, the foundation and the narrative of work is lost. Okay, even as Christians, we don't know why it works. We follow the world to say that work is just profit maximization. It's, we are we're in the work for ourselves. But the foundation is we are building God's kingdom. So building God's kingdom doesn't just happen when Jesus came. Uh, and Jesus said the kingdom of God is here. Building God's kingdom started in Genesis. We represent God. So the big idea for us today is work is building God's kingdom in every arena of life. Work is building God's kingdom in every arena of life. So what does it mean to build God's kingdom in every arena of life through work? What does it mean? The first thing it means is that work is the discipleship of individual. Okay, work is the discipleship of individual. You know, uh, last time... uh, uh, there's, there's this book by this, uh, this author called Gary Thomas. So he wrote this book called The Sacred Marriage. Uh, and in his book, Sacred Marriage, uh, he said something that was quite radical, uh, that shocked uh, the Christian world at that time. He said that marriage is not just to make you happy. Okay, we all thought that we're going to marriage to make you happy, right? Marriage is to make you holy. That's like, wow, I didn't know. I got into marriage because my partner is supposed to make me happy. But if he's not making me happy, I should divorce him or her. Very natural, right? But the radical thing is that marriage is supposed to not just make you happy, but to make you holy. It's the same with work. Many of us go into work thinking that work is supposed to give me a sense of identity, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of gratification. And if it doesn't, I'm going to quit my work. I'm going to move somewhere else. Uh, and the story will repeat itself. Uh, that, uh, and we fail to realize that for Christian, work is actually a means by which God uses it to disciple us. A very important means. Okay? And uh, it, it, it takes up uh, 40% of our work, uh, waking lives. And God uses it to disciple us. And, and if we fail to understand that, we fail to understand the purpose of work. So if you remember King David... King David had a very lowly job. What was his job? Shepherd boy. Okay, very lowly, very dirty job. Okay, but as, as a shepherd, you know, he, he might not be very motivated to go to work. Okay, he has to take care of the sheep and clear their stuff and it's a dirty job. It's the most lowly job. But as a shepherd, did he take his job seriously? He has no gratification for him, but did he take his job seriously? Yes. How do you know he takes his job seriously? He practiced the sling. So well that it can kill uh, lions, bears to protect the sheep. Okay, he had time to meditate on God. So he did his job well, even though you know, it, it doesn't really gratify him anyway. Did he know that one day he's going to use his skill of a sling to kill a giant? Did he know that? He didn't. He just did his job well, day in, day out. And when the time came to open, he had a chance to slay a Goliath. He did it because... He did his mundane job well. And that opened a way for him to be the king. So in the same way, your job might might not be very uh, satisfying, but it is a means of discipleship if you are able to see that. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Born servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service, eye power, or people pleasers, just to you know, make, uh, make a boss happy, but as born servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's born servant or free. And masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So as you read this, uh, Paul is not uh, advocating slavery. Slavery is just part of the, uh, what's happening there. 
Uh, and uh, as you look at this, it's basically talking about uh, employer, employee, uh, boss, subordinate relationship. Uh, and, and as subordinate, as employee, what, what are they called to do? They're called to obey your earthly master and uh, obey your bosses, not just on the surface, uh, not eye-pleasing, uh, eye you know, but what, what's the difficult part? From the, from the heart, sincere heart. You have to submit to them. It doesn't say submit to a good boss. Huh? It says submit to your boss. Okay, so as long as your boss is not asking you to sin, what is the command here? Submit to them. Is it easy to do? Easy or not? All of you have very good boss. Huh? No problem submitting. Huh? Okay, not easy. It's very hard. You can pretend to submit, but you know, at the end, wow, this fellow, huh? you know, you're cursing him at the back of your, of your breath. Very difficult. Uh, I've, I've experienced this discipleship as well. You know, uh, you know, bosses, different bosses. You know, sometimes, uh, wow, so difficult. Easier to submit to Christ, very easy. But submit to human boss, very difficult. Uh, but the, the discipleship here is that you, you need to submit to them from the heart because they've been placed there by God over your life. And I experienced this myself. Whenever I, I don't submit to a boss, okay, and I say, wow, I'm, I'm going to leave the company or I'm going to rebel, uh, against this boss because he's such a lousy boss. So, but when I try to do that, okay, it always doesn't work. I'll try to find a job. I'll try, it doesn't work, well, you know. For some reason, I all block, all close the doors. It's happened a few times. So I always ask, well, God, why are you closing all the doors? Huh? What's happening? Why can't I escape from Pharaoh? When can I leave the, the wilderness? I've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. It's time, God. Time, it's time. The answer is always no. I was like very, very frustrated with God. But it's only, uh, always, uh, it's always only when I submit to my human boss from the heart uh, that God opened the door and said, okay, it's time for you to go. It's very strange, right? You know? And it's happened a few times, so I know it's true okay, for myself. So God uses it to disciple us, to say, hey, you have to submit to your boss from the heart. And then God gives you the green light to move on because you have learned your lesson. But the problem is that you know, I have to learn many times uh, because I, I can't learn it well. So, so it's the same way. It's to disciple our hearts so that we can be more like Christ. Same, if you are a manager, your employee says here, don't use what? Don't use fear. Don't threaten them. And you must be? No, no partiality. Okay, no partiality. Is it, is it difficult to do? All the managers here, people under you, okay? No partiality, very hard, right? Objective, very hard, right? Care for them, right? Don't use fear. Inspire them, very hard. Okay, uh, I, I have managed different people before. You know, the, the hardest one are, are people what? You know, uh, people who are unteachable, very hard. People who think they are superstars, very hard. People who are your peers, Suddenly, you have to manage them very hard. Okay? But it teaches me patience. So the discipleship is in the area of patience. So in our work, the first thing that God wants to deal with is the discipleship of us. God wants to transform us. God wants to build His kingdom in us first through work. So remember, God is not, uh, work is not just to make you happy. It is to make you holy. So if you are suffering under your job, Okay, it's normal. See it as a discipleship process. And when God gives you the green light, okay, then it's time to go. But in the meantime, please submit to your boss with your heart. Wow, a lot to chew on. Huh? Okay, second reason why is work for? Second reason, work is obviously provision for family, correct? Uh, and uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is very clear. It's provision. The Bible is very practical. It's not you know, telling you some ideal story. It is to provide for a family. And this is what Apostle Paul says. He says, Even when we were with you, we give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Wow. I think he's more direct than me. Okay? If you don't work, don't eat. Wow. Next, what is, he, what is he trying to say? He says, if anyone does not provide for his relative, especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow. Very strong words. Uh. Paul, why so strong? 
Okay? Uh, Paul is very strong because a lazy work attitude, ethic, uh, a lazy work attitude, uh, work ethic is not Christian and it's unacceptable. Okay? And uh, what Paul is saying, if you can work, you better work. Okay? So that you not be a burden to other people. You can provide for your family. You can be a blessing to others. Okay? And uh, don't be lazy. Uh, in, in the Greek culture, in the New Testament, you know what the, what the Greeks culture teach about? Greeks value contemplation. Okay? That's why philosopher is the highest place in Greek culture. They, they value thinking, uh, you know, leisure. That's where you get the Olympics, games, okay? And, and they look down on work, manual work, menial work. Okay? So, so Paul is going against the culture of the Greek to say that, hey, you need to work okay, to provide because when you are idle, what happens? Idleness is the devil's workshop. Okay? When you have nothing to do, the devil is going to come and he's going to give you uh, different things that will tempt you. All right? So work, is, is, it gives you, it gives you uh, uh, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a sense of dignity. And Jesus himself was what? He was a carpenter. What about Apostle Paul? What was he? He was a, he was a tent maker. So, Apostle Paul worked hard to support himself. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, um, if you have someone in your family who doesn't work, it is very challenging. Okay? Um, maybe it's, it is... It is it, uh, it, I'm not talking about those with medical reason or whatever. I'm, uh, th those who don't work, actually, they need a lot of encouragement. Because... It seems like they don't work, but actually there's a lot of psychological barrier that we need to help them, we need to assist them, we need to walk with them uh, on this journey of working. Uh, and and the, the Singapore government actually is quite good. They have, uh, at E2I, they actually have career coaches free. Okay, You can go to them uh, and ask for, for advice with regards to your, uh, your, your resume, all that. Uh, and, 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 and we need to assist and help. Any family members who are struggling in this area, we need to walk with them because it's very scary for them. Okay? And we want to help them to go on to the journey of being independent. Uh, my daughter, my daughter uh, just graduated from uh, A-levels. So, uh, you know, every month you're supposed to give allowance, right? To, to your children. So, uh, after she graduated, I, I, I immediately cut the allowance. Wow. So... So heartless, right? Heartless. Okay, now I'm trying to explain. Uh. It's not that I'm heartless. Uh. I'm trying to teach her the value of work. So she, you know, she went out, you know, uh, different jobs, uh, teaching, tuition. But then now uh, she knows the value of work, you know. She said, wow, I work so long. Uh, the, uh, the money is so little. Uh, I better find something higher paying. Also, she's going to find tuition, you know, better, better pay. So what, what were you doing? We're teaching them the value of work. Okay, so that she can save up for a university tuition fee. So it is a value. We need to learn to be independent, stand on. It's part of discipleship. Okay, providing for your family, providing for yourself. So it's a discipleship journey uh, for, for her. So today, uh, you know, uh, if, if you have somebody in, in your family who's struggling in this area, encourage them, assist them, help them, walk along them because it is scary especially for those who have been out of job for some time, it affects their self-esteem. Okay, it affects their confidence. And we must slowly guide and nudge them. All right? Third thing, what is work for? Work is, work is ministry. Okay, work is ministry. What is our first job as a worker? Let me, let me ask you, what is your first job as a worker? What is your first job as a worker? How many of you think your first job as a worker is to share Christ? Raise your hands. Huh? Nobody? Uh? Wow, not bad. Uh? Nobody? Uh? First job is a, is, as a worker is to share Christ. Nobody? Uh? Okay, you are right. Uh? You are right. Very good. Theologically sound. Okay? So the first job as a worker is not to share Christ. Uh? Even though my, my title is ministry. Uh? Your first job as a worker is what? Is to do your job well. Okay, so do, a lot of Christians think, oh, first job, well, I go to work, I, it's for me to share Christ. No, 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 no. The first job as a worker is what? In Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do it heartily. As for the Lord and not for man. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance 
as your reward, you are serving the Lord Jesus. So your first job as a worker is to do your job well. Okay? Do you want to hear Christ from a, a, a lousy pilot? Or not? One, uh, the one, right? You make sure you fly a plane properly first. Okay? You, want, you want to hear Christ, uh, the second job as a worker is you must have integrity. Okay? You must have character. Do you want to hear Christ from a dishonest financial advisor? No? One, no, no. Immediately, no. So in the same way in your job, in order to earn the, the right to speak for God, uh, you must do these two things well first. First, you must do your job well. Second, you must have integrity. You must be a person of principle. Then, that's your third job. What's your third job? The third job, then can, you are a missionary or a pastor in your workplace. So not, not just me, I'm a pastor, uh, by the way. You guys are all full-time pastors. You guys are all full-time missionary. Wow, scary. Eh? Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a full-time pastor and full-time missionary. See, can come out uh, from your mouth. Wow, very hard to come out. Very hard. Okay? okay? Uh, it's very scary, but it's true. Uh, because what did God say? You are the salt and light. You are the salt and light. Means what? You're supposed to go to your workplace as salt. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to preserve morality, preserve decay. What else are you supposed to do as salt? You're supposed to add flavor, the right flavor. Huh? What else? As light, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to shine in darkness. You say, my workplace is very, very dark. Eh? Cannot shine. Well, precisely because it's so dark that you're there. If it's not dark, don't need you. In my workplace, well, all nine or ten, all Christian. Are you wrong? Huh? Maybe you should go to a darker one. Okay? So you are the light. You're supposed to shine. Okay? So a lot of Christians even don't tell people they are Christian, you know? Don't pray during makan. It's a covert one, covert. Hey, no, 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 no. I don't know. Hey, how to shine? Like that? I don't know. I don't understand. No. You have no choice. You have to. You have to first do your job well and then people have to know you're a Christian. If not, how are you going to shine? There's no way. A lot of covert Christians. It's very hard. Like, we try not to tell because uh, later very hard to fire them. But, but, no, you have to tell them because you know who, who knows who, what kind of witness are you? You know, so, so that's your third job. You have to be a missionary. You have to be a pastor because there are some jobs that maybe you're the only Christian there. God has sent you to that mission field. That is your mission field. You're there twenty four seven, not twenty four seven, uh, eight to five, Monday to Friday. That's your mission field. No one else. You're the walking epistle. Okay, you're the pastor. You're the missionary. Okay, so that's your job. That's your third job. The fourth job, what is your fourth job? The fourth job is that you are a, not just a pastor, not just a missionary, you are a king. You are a king over the place. Remember, you are royal co-creators. You are the king. That place, your workplace, you are the king. What do I mean by you are the king? It means when you are at the workplace, this is your arena where you rule and reign. Okay? So you must act like an owner, not like a hired hand. Means your place, make sure it's clean. Make sure it's well run. Okay, other people, table messy in their mind, but yours well run. Make sure it's proper. You do things well. Because that's your kingdom. Uh, and then, and then some, some people say, hey, Pastor, I'm, I'm just a cashier. How to be a, what, what kingdom? What, what, what reign? No, if you're a cashier, your cashier table is, you're the, you're the kingdom there. Lor. That is your kingdom. Uh, do it well. Do your job well. Smile. Greet, make sure you have enough money, uh, balance, don't lose money. Okay, make sure you pack the food properly. You know, fresh food with fresh food, you know, that's your job. You know, uh, the, the person that left the greatest impression on me, right, is actually a cashier, a McDonald's cashier at Queensway Shopping Center. Up to today, I, wow, I can still remember her face. She's like almost like an old lady, okay, uh, almost going to retire. But when I go there, she's always smiling. Wow, how can I help you? She'll bring my food to my table. Wow, I'm stunned, you know. She should be the best worker. So up to today, when I think of good service, I see her face. Wow. So that is the power of changing culture. As a king, you manage the place. So uh, our dear friend, Gerald, Gerald, if you know him. Gerald here, is, uh, he's, uh, he's a server. Okay, he, he serves food. And I'm, I'm so blessed by him because every... Two, three weeks, he will send me a text. You know what's the text or not? What his customers say about his good service. Wow. Gerald, changing culture. He's the king at his workplace. Okay? Doesn't matter where. 
People send you a letter of commendation, and there you are, you must have done something. Okay, so, so you, you can change culture wherever, it doesn't matter, you don't have to be the manager. Okay, you can, any level, you can change culture, you are the king. In your workplace, you can redeem the culture. Okay, and uh, whether you're a student, whether you're a retired homemaker, you can also change culture wherever God has placed you. And, and, and some of you who are in management, even better, you don't just change culture, you have the power to change policies, you have the power to change structure. You're really like a king. Okay, so if you're in management, uh, your job is uh, even more important. Okay, because if you have unjust structures, unjust system, you are not treating your staff well. Okay, uh, there is no, uh, there is no proper uh, accountability to the people that you lead. And uh, we as bosses, we as uh, managers, we have a, we have a, we have a, we have a need uh, to make sure that our systems are just, our systems are compassionate. Okay, at the same time. And um, I was talking to this uh, lecturer, you know, he's from NUS. So he's saying, oh, uh, I finished my sixth year. Uh, I'm going for a six months paid sabbatical. Wow. I was like, wow, NUS, I'm so impressed. Very Christian. Must be a Christian thing of it, man. <laughs> okay? Six months, he go go uh, to learn somewhere, fully paid. You know, so it has a very compassionate uh, system uh, that blesses the staff. Okay, so so we 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 as people in management, we uh, have a have a duty, okay, to take care of our people and manage them well. So today in your work, are you a good and honest worker? Today in your work, uh, do do you see yourself as a missionary and pastor in your work? Today in your work, do you see yourself as a king? Uh, ability to change culture, ability to change policies and structure. Okay. So that is your ministry. Lastly, what does work do? Work as a kingdom uh, builder is that you are contributing, bringing value to society. Okay, you're bringing value to society. Not just your organization, but your society. In Jeremiah 29 verse 4, uh, this is a passage where Israel was uh, exiled to Babylon. It says, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles which have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What are they supposed to do in Babylon? They're supposed to build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage. They will bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city which I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find your welfare. It's a very strange passage because uh, normally when, when a, 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 a nation goes into exile, what do the prophets usually say? The prophets say, hey, get ready to leave. Huh? You know, try and uh, uh, pray that you'll be able to leave. You know, don't, don't, don't stay there too long. Uh, you know, don't, don't pray for the people who are enemies who exile you. Okay, they are your enemy. Don't bless them. Okay? But here, uh, Jeremiah carries the word of God say, hey, you're in exile, you're in this foreign land, okay, that God used to oppress you. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to plant your roots, work there, reproduce, stay there. And more importantly is, don't work against the system, okay? Don't work against the Babylonian system. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to pray for the welfare of the city. Okay, they're supposed to pray, because when the city do well, they will do well. So it's the same with us. We all work in pagan environments, unless you're so blessed you work in the church, okay? We all work in pagan company, we work with non-Christians, we work with bosses who are non-Christian. It doesn't matter whether they're Christian or not. What matters is you must plant your roots there, you must take ownership of your place, do your work well, pray for the welfare of the city, pray for the welfare of the company, okay? And when you do that, what does God say? You will be blessed in return, okay? Do well for the city, contribute to the city. So in the same way, uh, whatever work we do, we are bringing value to the society. We are bringing something of value. Then some people say, hey, uh, I'm a delivery man. What value am I bringing? I'm a gig economy worker. I bring, I'm bringing milk. What value is there to the society? Well, this is what uh, Martin Luther says. Okay, Martin Luther says this. God himself 
will milk the cows through him whose vocation that is. He who engages in the lowliness of his work perform God's work, be he lad or king. What God is trying to say is that you are God's hand. Okay, the farmer is God's hand, milks the, 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 the cow. Okay, the farmer is God's hand. The cow goes to the, the plant where the, uh, the scientists or the chemist pasteurize the milk. Okay, and then it goes to the factory. You pack the milk. Okay, and then what happens? Supermarket, there's a cashier who, who uh, sells the milk to you. And if you don't want to go to the supermarket, what happens? You send grab driver to bring the milk to your house. Okay? So is he providing value to society? Yes. He is part of God's hand to deliver that milk from the cow to your house. Are you providing value? Yes. Every work that you do provides value to society. So don't look down on your work. Your work has intrinsic value. Okay? You can bless somebody. Uh, and, and if you don't despise it, God can use your work. So you must see your work in a different light. Okay? Uh, you, 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 unless you work in a tobacco company uh, or, you know, uh, you know uh, gambling or uh, every work has a value to society. Okay? You must pray, uh, okay? Uh, whether, you know, the product you are producing actually bring value no, or bring harm. Okay? Then you have to pray, God, am I in the right? Am I bringing value to society? Okay? So if you are, you are part of that a supply chain that God uses to deliver His goods to other people. And uh, we give thanks, okay, that, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, our, in our government, for example, in our government, we give thanks there are many Christians inside, okay, they are able to uh, come up with policies uh, that are uh, God-fearing, okay, that preserve our family values and our morality. So, so uh, these people are put there, okay, uh, in, in society to benefit everyone. So in the same way, whether you are in education, maybe you're in the education sector, you can play a role to bless society through good policies. If you're in media, if you're in entertainment, if you're in business, all these are key structures okay, where you can make a difference to society in, in what policies are coming out. And whatever you do actually makes a difference. Okay? So whether it's a lowly uh, a farmer, or you are in a government, or you are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, the, the office of a higher place, doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you must see there is a value to society, and what you do has intrinsic value, has intrinsic value. And, and whatever you do, you need to know that at the end of the day, whatever skills that you have accomplished on earth, it will not be wasted, because in a new heaven and new earth, Christ is the new government, and your skills will be able to be used in the new heaven and new earth. Okay, whatever you learn uh, can be used in the coming days, okay? in, the, in the coming age. And I want to end off with uh, this, this example, this analogy uh, of uh, uh, this, this, this place that I went to uh, in my Philippines. I went to Manila, in this place, for a mission trip. And uh, this, this is somebody that, um, his name is uh, Tony Malonto. Okay, Tony Malonto. And he, uh, he started this he started this farm, okay? So it's, it's called a, a Perazzo Farm. Perazzo Farm, okay? In Manila, about one and a half hours away from uh, the airport. So he started this farm. And um, this farm actually uh, encapsulates my sermon because uh, it, it, it disciples the individuals there. So you see the ladies there, some of them, okay? They are, they are employees. Some of them are employees. Some of them are there to, to be healed. So one uh, just lost her husband, so she's there to, to get healing, to rest. Uh, she, he employs, uh, the guy with white hair, that's uh, Tony, okay? Uh, he employs single mom, okay? And um, uh, they, 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 they go there to rest, okay, uh, to heal. So he disciples the employees. He has, a, um, he has uh, this um, agriculturist who, who does the farm for him. Okay, so they are there uh, to, to be discipled. And uh, this farm actually provides provision for family. Okay, what do I mean by that? This farm, he created this farm for seniors. Okay, seniors means because uh, not, nothing much is done for the seniors uh, it, 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 over there. So he created this farm so that seniors can age with dignity. 
and they can work on the farm. Okay, so uh, they, they can do the packing, they can do the cooking, they can do the planting. Okay, so uh, it's a huge farm. Okay, and uh, you've got, you got tomatoes, got brinjals, and, and they work on this farm and they produce, uh, can you see the, the cans there? The bottles there? They are pickled, pickled products. They produce vegetables, honey. Uh, so, so they sell all these pickled products uh, of high standard to the open market. And the whole farm is self-sufficient. Okay? And the elderly is able to provide for their family uh, through, through, this, um, through this work there. And uh, it's a ministry as well. So every Sunday, hundreds of uh, poor seniors will come to the farm. They have a free meal there. Okay? They will bless them with the gospel. Uh, they, they provide rooms for people to rest. There's a, there's a conference room. There is a chapel there. Okay, so people come here, uh, go there to receive ministry. And whatever they produce, okay, whatever they produce, they, they, they sell it. Okay? Sell it online. So they produce good products that bless the wider society. Okay? Different goods. Uh, and, and this is an idea of somebody who is able to bring God's kingdom okay? to the individuals, to the family, to the organization, as well as to society. Okay, so so he, he, uh, he encapsulates work as that kingdom builder uh, and how work can bless every arena of society. I want to invite the worship team uh, to come forward. So this, this morning, as we look at these four areas of work, maybe you want to ask yourself, uh, which, which, area are you, which area are you struggling Maybe it's the first area, you know, you are under a very difficult and toxic environment. Uh, maybe difficult colleagues, difficult boss. And what is the Lord teaching you in terms of discipleship for yourself? Maybe in the second area, you're struggling to uh, make ends meet for your family. Maybe you're out of job. Maybe um, you don't earn enough. Maybe you want to ask the Lord to provide for your family, even at this time. Thirdly, maybe you are in your work and uh, you have never seen work as a ministry. You've never seen yourself as a pastor, as a missionary, as a king in your workplace. Today, you may ask the Lord, Lord, how can I be that walking epistle in the workplace that you have placed me? And lastly, value to society. Maybe you think your, 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 your services and your product doesn't make a difference. You find work meaningless. But maybe if you look at it in a different light, whatever you're doing is bringing value to society. God, you are God's hands and God's feet in bringing that goods and service to different ones in the community. And there is value, there's intrinsic value in what you do. Just lift our hands even as I close in prayer. As a response, the Lord say, Lord, use me in my area of work. Just lift our hand wherever you are. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, you see those hands, they are lifted up. Father, we give thanks for the privilege to be counted worthy as your kingdom builders, O oh Lord. Father, we give thanks for anointing each of us as your royal co-creators. Thank you for giving us the authority and the power to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In every sphere of work, Father, I pray you anoint your servants right now with the anointing oil from heaven, O oh Lord that they will be anointed to do their work well because they represent you. Father, even as they do their work well, give them the power, the authority to speak on your behalf, O Lord, that they will carry the gospel, they will be walking in pieces wherever you have placed them, O Lord, that they will be the sword and light where you have placed them, that the gospel will be seen through their word, their deed and their lifestyle, O Lord. Father, anoint your people, O Lord, uh, that they will be bearers of good news, O Lord. They will carry your presence into every workplace. Fill every workplace with your presence, O Lord. Right now, even as they go in, they will know the difference because these are your ambassadors, O Lord. Father, I pray uh, for those who are struggling in this area. Maybe there's a toxic environment. Maybe there's provision lacking in their homes, O Lord. Father, I pray you'll be the Lord provider. You'll disciple us even though it's difficult, O Lord so that we can be more like you, Lord. Help us to respond 
in a way that glorify your name, O Lord. Help us to be changed through the process of the work that you put us through. We give thanks that we are not there by accident. You have called and placed us there for a season. So I pray you anoint us and use us, O Lord, that we will be changed. And even as we are changed, O Lord, we are able to touch lives for you, O Lord. So bless our work that you will bring value, not just our own family, but to society, O Lord. That whatever we are doing, bless the work of our hands, O Lord. That through it, O Lord, many will be blessed, O Lord. So we give thanks, we give thanks for this time and may you dismiss us, O Lord, that we will carry your anointing and your presence wherever you have placed us, O Lord. That it's a privilege to represent you uh, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.